So on 23rd of September, the Federal Communications Commission approved new rules uh, allowing white space spectrum to be used for what is being called Wi-Fi on steroids. Uh, could you please explain what exactly this white space is and what will the new rules mean for wireless users? This is an incredibly important decision because it's uh, the first time that the FCC has allowed a new kind of spectrum use. Uh, traditionally, in wireless communications, the FCC exclusively licensed spectrum. So it said, for example, a television station has the right to transmit on a certain channel, and no one else can transmit there. And about 20 years ago, the FCC allowed for a different kind of spectrum use, which is called unlicensed, which is they took some bands that were, that were very congested and, and seemed to be fairly useless and just opened them up. They said anyone who wants to transmit can transmit here, as long as you follow certain technical mechanisms to allow the spectrum to be shared. And that latter category is what allowed for Wi-Fi to exist. Um, and even though this was considered junk spectrum, a, a tremendous market grew up around Wi-Fi because it was open to innovation, because devices could be made and share the spectrum as opposed to one licensee having total control and, and dominance over how that spectrum got used. So white space is, in, in a way, is a hybrid of the two. The FCC has allocated spectrum for television broadcasting. Uh, but you have to remember that that spectrum was, was first allocated back in the 1950s and 1960s when technology was much less sophisticated than today. So what the FCC did was they set up uh, large sectums, uh, sectors of the spectrum that was actually dark. Uh, that could not be used for transmission in order to protect different broadcasters. So you think about it the way a, a, a TV station works, it, it broadcasts out from one location. So if I have a television station broadcasting in Philadelphia and another station is broadcasting on the same frequency in New York, those signals would, would be seen to interfere because the televisions were, were not sophisticated enough to tell them apart. So what the FCC basically did uh, was, for example, say in Philadelphia you can transmit on channel 3, and in New York you can transmit on channel 4. But the, the reverse pairs, channel 4 in Philadelphia is dark, and channel 3 in New York is dark. That's an extraordinary waste of spectrum. Uh, it's a, spectrum is, is, is so terribly important to so many services and so much economic development today, and the FCC had to make it completely unused. Technology has come a long way since then. And so white spaces is about unlocking the potential of those unused corners of the broadcast spectrum. And so what the FCC did uh, for the first time uh, in this decision is said, we're not going to uh, get rid of the exclusively licensed spectrum. All the broadcasters are still licensed where they are, uh, but we can allow unlicensed devices to operate around those licensed frequencies. And that's potentially revolutionary. Well, the broadcasters had opposed the earlier uh, uh, FCC's approach. Uh, are they satisfied now with the new rules, or are there still uh, concerns? Broadcasters have, have expressed very strong concerns all along about the white spaces proposal, but the FCC has been working at this uh, since 2002. So it spent eight years, and the FCC has some very excellent technical expertise, uh, and it has open proceedings. So they, they've had the technical experts on all sides submit prototype devices, test them, do the technical analysis, and what they found is that the interference concerns that the broadcasters raise are just wildly overblown. So the FCC in this proceeding put into place various mechanisms to protect uh, both incumbent broadcasters as well as there's some other users, for example, wireless microphones at sporting events and, and theater and so forth. Um, the FCC put a number of restrictions in place to protect them. So I, I would not expect that the broadcast industry would say they're happy with this, uh, but I think the FCC has been very cognizant of their concerns because they, they certainly don't want to have a situation where, where people's televisions get interrupted because of these other services. Uh, what are likely to be some of the first deployments uh, of, of, the, of the new spectrum? Do you see implications in the areas of, say, healthcare, education? There have actually already been experimental deployments. So, for example, Microsoft uh, has developed a research technology called WhiteFi, which is, which is a, a set of protocols to build Wi-Fi-like systems on white spaces, which they got an experimental license and they've actually deployed on the Microsoft campus uh, in, in Washington. Uh, and then there's some other companies that have deployed white spaces systems in, in rural areas uh, where it's hard to reach them with traditional broadband uh, mechanisms. One of the great advantages of, of, wife, of uh, white spaces is that it uses low frequency spectrum. So the television broadcast brands are, are very good in terms of propagation. They, a, a signal can reach uh, through uh, trees and through buildings in a way that higher frequency uh, cellular frequencies and Wi-Fi frequencies can't. 
So some rural areas are looking at for that use. There's also been great interest in using it for smart grid energy deployments uh, in terms of monitoring uh, distributed uh, power networks. Uh, the potential is really uh, quite broad, again, because it's an unlicensed technology uh, any company can make devices uh, that, that uh, can share this spectrum, and then anyone can take those devices and use them for different kinds of applications. You know, FCC uh, Chairman Julius Janikowski uh, recently said that the opening up of the spectrum would provide a, what he called a platform for innovators and entrepreneurs. Uh, what kind of um, uh, innovation opportunities do you foresee coming out of this? Well, look, look at what's already happened with Wi-Fi. Uh, it, it started off as a, a, a protocol for enterprise networking, and now it's in every device you can think of. It's in, it's in your iPhone, it's in laptops, it's in uh, entertainment devices, and being used for, for all sorts of applications. Again, because it's, it's distributed, be, because uh, the innovation and the use case is not dependent on one service provider saying, this is Spectrum for the following use. Uh, so I think we'll see the same thing with uh, white spaces. Uh, and in particular, I think we'll see great innovation in areas where the existing wireless technologies don't go. So there are lots of rural areas in the United States and worldwide uh, that don't have affordable solutions. And again, part of the advantage of this unlicensed approach uh, is that companies can make large volumes of devices, which pushes the unit cost down. And that allows for situations where maybe there's another technology that, that theoretically could serve that use, uh, but the costs are so low because the devices are cheap and someone doesn't need to acquire a license to the spectrum, uh, that people will pick them up and use them for interesting things. So I, I think you know, we'll start to see them in these edge cases, and, and, and then uh, we'll see, just as we saw with Wi-Fi, where large companies like Cisco and Intel got on the bandwagon and ramped them up for, for more uh, traditional mainstream uses. I think we'll see the same thing. You, you referred to uh, Microsoft's use already, and Microsoft, of course, was a big champion of the new, new rules. Uh, also, companies like Google and Dell have been pushing the FCC uh, to pass these rules. Uh, what do you see as some of the uses that companies like uh, Google and Dell could uh, put these uh, new rules to? I, I've said in the past that, that wireless communications capacity is the oil of the 21st century. It's, it's the fundamental input that the information and network economy runs on. Um, and increasingly, we're, we're seeing explosive demand and use for, for wireless in all sorts of areas. As I said, both uh, traditional kinds of uses like, like communication, wireless broadband, uh, entertainment applications, both in the home and, and outside the home, as well as things like smart grid, remote healthcare, um, and, and all sorts of sensor applications. All of those need wireless capacity. And so all of the major companies that are in the uh, technology realm recognize that everything's going to be wireless enabled and it's going to be wireless enabled in multiple ways. So if you're a company like Dell that's building devices, you're selling millions and millions of laptops and other kinds of mobile devices, you want to wireless enable those. And you want to wireless enable those in the most flexible possible way, uh, which means you don't want to have a situation where you're beholden to a wireless carrier um, that's going to control how that's going to be used. You want to put a cheap chip into your laptop and then build software around it and, and build a platform around it. Um, and the same thing with Microsoft. They're, they're looking at, at various different applications and opportunities in different markets. Google, all those companies. Uh, Philips has also been involved uh, using it for, for high-speed media uh, shifting around the home. So again, the, the possibilities are really endless. Uh, do you see any downside around the new rules? I mean, for example, uh, are there any securities is uh, security issues that we should be concerned about? There are always security issues, and uh, they're not inherent in the uh, FCC uh, mandates, but uh, systems that are built on this technology, especially if they're in mission critical areas like, for example, smart grid monitoring, are going to need good security. But there's, there's nothing fundamentally insecure about unlicensed wireless. Uh, it's sort of like saying there's nothing fundamentally insecure about open source software, which for a long time people would also say, but you, you look and it's being used by banks and governments and so forth. Um, so, so security is, is, is important, but not a fundamental problem. Uh, there are real issues. Um, th th there are legitimate worries about interference, and, and systems need to be built to ensure that they don't do that. Uh, and there also are legitimate worries that the FCC was too restrictive, that the, the power limits and other kinds of restrictions that it put into place 
uh, to prevent interference with the incumbent systems might might overly limit where this could be used. Um, I, I get I get concerned when people talk about this as Wi-Fi on steroids or super Wi-Fi because it is different. Wi-Fi doesn't have those limitations. So, for example, you're not going to be able to use a white space system uh, around uh, the Broadway region of New York City because there's so many wireless microphones there for the the theater production, and there's nothing like that in in Wi-Fi. Maybe there there are various ways around it. Uh, but the point is the, the expectations may be a little ahead of the reality. We've got to realize there are those limits and get devices into the field and see how realistic the concerns are. And I'm hopeful that the FCC will look at the data uh, and potentially if it sees that some of the interference concerns haven't happened, uh, then it could go back and loosen the rules. Uh, could you, uh, just to wind up, uh, outline what you see as some of the immediate effects of the new rules and what could be sort of the longer term impact that will roll out more gradually? Mm -hmm. Well, the immediate effect is that all these companies that have been involved in this proceeding for up to eight years are going to start building devices. Uh, so, so companies like Cisco and companies like Intel and Philips and Dell and so forth are, are going to start uh, developing uh, chips and hardware. And the uh, technical community, uh, the networking community, which has already been involved developing technical standards and protocols, is going to kick that into overdrive. Um, and companies like Google and Microsoft are going to start uh, doing interesting deployments. And we'll see this start to roll out. It, it's, not, it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, just as Wi-Fi uh, was authorized by the FCC in the, in the mid-1980s, but really took until the mid-90s uh, until the, the, the protocols and the, and the devices were there at mass market volumes. But I think we're going to see this, this flow through and this, and this kind of wave that's going to build and build uh, in this area. The longer term uh, question is, is still open. I, I think that if we look at uh, white spaces not just as one particular authorization of a particular technology, but a new model for how we do spectrum allocation, there's uh, even greater opportunities. In particular, one rule that the FCC put into place to protect against interference is what's called a geolocation database. So they said each uh, white space device, either itself or it needs to be connected to a device that does this, has to have a database that can uh, have a, a, a map of the spectral environment. Uh, here's a television station that's licensed in this area. Here's a wireless microphone, and, and wireless microphone companies could actually add to the database. And it needs to check that database and use that to say, OK, in this particular area at this particular time, I can transmit on this frequency or not. Um, and that, that's something that, that helps prevent interference because it's such a, a complex, dynamic environment. I think it actually has great potential to be used much more broadly. Because when you think about it, again, go back to what I said at the beginning, the problem is we have this traditional fixed spectrum allocation system uh, where lots and lots of providers in all different areas have gotten allocations based on historical technologies. And we actually look at transmission. If you actually put up a, an antenna and a spectrum analyzer, you find that most of the spectrum is empty most of the time in most of the United States and the rest of the world. Um, so how do we unlock that? And, and we have to unlock that. I mean, there's such extraordinary uh, economic investment going behind all these applications, both consumer and, and business. Uh, I think one way that we do that is to develop mechanisms sort of the way the domain name system works for the internet um, that, that are an intermediation point that help identify what's available and match up demand and capacity on a real-time basis. We don't need to do that through a, necessarily a, a market, although some of those mechanisms might be economic mechanisms, uh, but we need infrastructure uh, to fulfill that demand on a real-time basis. I think the white spaces database could become that. That's not what the FCC proposed or mandated. Uh, in fact, they did it for very different reasons. Uh, but I think this might be, when we look back 20 or 30 years from now, this might be the foundation of, of an entirely different uh, regime for wireless communication. Kevin, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you.